So my father always told me that it didn't matter if you were a dog catcher. If you had a uniform, you were in danger when the Soviets came. So my grandfather fled to Latvia with other Poles involved with the military or civil service. So he was in Vilno, which is very close to the Latvian border. So uh, he, along with other individuals, I don't know if he went with a group or by himself, uh, but there were Polish troops, there were Polish Air Force, some, art, uh, some armored divisions, um, and other individuals of influence escaped to Latvia. <clears throat> so a little bit of background. Soviet authorities regarded service to the pre-war Polish state as a crime against revolution, quote unquote, and counter-revolutionary activity. And they proceeded to arrest large numbers of Polish intelligentsia. These were former officials, politicians, civil servants and scientists, intellectuals and the clergy, as well as ordinary people thought to pose a threat to Soviet rule. Now, since all Poles were Soviet citizens, they were unfortunately subject to Soviet justice, which could work retroactively. In other words, it could cover crimes committed before the Red Army gained control over the region. As a result, many were charged under Article 58 of the Soviet Penal Code, Paragraph 13, as quote-unquote historical counter-revolution. This was employed against those who had fought against communism during the Russian Civil War period or in the Polish army against Bolsheviks during the 1919 to 1920 war. When the Russians invaded, there was an evacuation of politicians, public officers, and professionals to Latvia, which was neutral at the time. The Poles were subsequently detained in prisons, although a trickle of prisoners made their way out of internment camps and escaped to Britain via Sweden. The majority, approximately 12,000, fell into Soviet hands only when Stalin moved against the Baltic states in the summer of 1940. Walter Smoczynski was in jail in Kolatuva, Latvia, and transferred to a Russian prison in Arkhangelsk, near the White Sea. In the two years between the invasion of Poland and the 1941 attack on the USSR by Germany, the Soviets arrested and imprisoned about 500,000 Poles. This was about one in 10 of all male adults. This is a postcard written by my grandmother, my mother's mother, uh, to her husband, Władysław uh, Smoczynski, when he was interned in Kualatuva, Latvia. Dear Władziu, I haven't heard from you in a long time. I'm very worried. Please write and I'll feel better. I'm doing fine, I'm healthy, and the kids are doing well. I'm planning on moving to my family. Perhaps the neighbors will help me move to my parents. I'm working, taking care of the cow and the kids. The cow is giving a lot of milk. Enough for the kids, and I'm selling some. Happy Easter. Genya, Halina, Danuta, till we meet again. This is the interment document uh, certifying the interment of my grandfather in the internment camp in Latvia. Apparently there were 15, Question. go ahead. On your previous slide, the, that postcard made it through and that's how it was preserved? Yeah, we have the actual postcard. Yeah, so my grandmother kept this. My, my grandfather was able to keep it through his imprisonment and it was a, it, Family heirloom, a memento. Yep. So she was still back in Poland. Yes, she was in Poland for a period of time. And they left her alone for a while. Yeah. So my mother's father was interred and then imprisoned in a Soviet prison and released in 1942 after amnesty was granted and mustering of the Polish <coughs> army in Russia. And I'll tell you the story about that in a minute. During the occupation, there was a mass movement of Poles to the USSR from 39 to 41. And according to Sword in his document, in his, in his book, uh, he notes that Soviets executed, imprisoned, or deported military officers, government officials, police, and civil servants. So my grandfather knew he was in danger. That's why he fled the country. 
They tar targeted the professional class as well, including college professors, physicians, and clergy. And simply membership in Polish organizations, like teachers' unions, riflemen's unions, which are basically shooting clubs, scouts, was sufficient evidence the individual was hostile to Soviet power. Over one million Poles were deported. According to the press and culture section of the Polish Second Corps, it was an army division, 1,600,000 had been removed from the region by the Soviets. 1.1 million were permanent residents of Eastern Poland. 336,000 were refugees that had fled the Nazi advance in the West to Eastern Poland. And 242,000 were soldiers that were mobilized in 1939 who were deported to Russia. So this is a story my father tells. February 10th, 1940, they came at 4 a.m. We were told to pack anything we could carry and were taken by horse-drawn wagons to a train station. It took two weeks to get to our final destination, Sechenga, northeast of Ka Moscow in what was considered Siberia. These are just taken from Google Images. These are sketches that were drawn by people that lived through this experience. If you can imagine being awakened at night after midnight in the winter, and a knock at the door, a Russian soldier, a Russian government official telling you whatever you can pack and put on a cart. So have you guys seen the movie Dr. Zhivago? You know the train, the ride on the train? It was the same thing for my parents. They were loaded in boxcars, 50 to 60 per car. Sorry. And the doors were sealed until the transports were in Russia, then only opened occasionally at scheduled stops. The occupants were provided food, which consisted of 500 grams of millet porridge and black bread per person every two to three days. These are, again, Google images. These aren't my parents' photos. At the time, my father had a dog, a white Schmitz. His name was Pikush. He says, we couldn't take our dog Pikush with us. So he was six at the time. I remember him walking, running. I remember watching him running along the train as we left. It was so sad. This is a slide uh, that shows a a museum uh, that documents what the Polish deportees went through in Poland. And it has some of the actual cars that were used at the time for transport of, of livestock and people. Where is that? This, I don't know what the location exactly. I didn't do any further investigation. But the funny thing about this slide is someone put a caption on the bottom that says, never a dull day in Poland. <laughs> so 50 to 60 people in a, in a car, four small windows, a small insufficient stove, and a hole in the floor for the call of nature. When they stopped, sometimes the doors were opened, and they were able to get out, stretch their legs, get some fresh air. My father tells a story of one episode where the train started moving while people were still outside the train. There was no warning. And he said the, his sister, Zosha, barely got back on the train. If she didn't make it, you never would have seen her again. There are also stories uh, that are documented in, in the sword book, eyewitness accounts of what was happening on the trains. Obviously, you had the whole spectrum of life, the elderly, the fit, the young, the vulnerable, newborns, and women who were breastfeeding, who weren't getting sufficient nutrition. After two weeks, the old and the frail died. They had to be buried or left if the train stopped. In some cases, the bodies of children were thrown out the window because they had no other alternative. There are different categories of deportees based on the Soviet system of justice. And I'm not quite sure if the Panics and Spachinskis were in separate categories or in the same. But the Soviet judicial system allowed for three degrees of administrative restriction of freedom for deportees. Number one, confinement to compulsory labor camps in the gulag with total deprivation of liberty. 
These were Poles that had been arrested formally and sentenced by the NKVD courts, even though many never appeared in person before a court and did not learn of their sentence until they had been in camp, in the jail, in the prison for some time. Number two, settlement and special economic units frequently equipped with farming stock and implements, the so-called special settlements, where work was performed under normal conditions and the deportee enjoyed freedom of movement within the locality. These were a class of deportee that had not been arrested or sentenced and were not deemed to be in need of quote unquote correctional labor. These were individuals and their families who were considered to be an anti-Soviet element, in quotes and of some value in terms of manual labor. They worked on the spetspostyolki, or pashoeks. And this is where, for certain, my, my father's family lived. Uh, I'm not quite certain about the Swachinskis. I think they might have been in the third category, which were individual exile to a definite locality, in which the given person lives freely but has no right to leave the locality and remains under NKVD supervision. These were free deportees, mainly women and children, who were not regarded as suitable for heavy work in forest or mines, but were nevertheless a socially dangerous element. The deportees from April 1940, which is when my mother was deported, and June 41 were mostly in this category, which consisted of the families of army personnel and police officers, like my grandfather, officials and others who had been arrested previously. They were shipped to the wilderness of northern Kazakhstan or the Altai Krai region near Mongolia. They were either lodged under the same roof as lo local villagers or given ramshackle accommodation and told to adapt to it. So I, I felt the Smachinskis were in this category. My mother doesn't have that many recollections because she was four years old during the deportation. Uh, but she also tells stories of her mother having to lay railroad ties for the Trans-Siberian Railroad. So there was some kind of work involved. Soviets officially estimate 1.2 million people were deported to the Soviet Union. Polish sources cite anywhere from 1.6 to 2.2 million Poles. And there were four waves of deportation of Poles from Poland to Russia when the, when the Soviets occupied Eastern Poland. Mm -hmm. February 1940, when my father was deported, 220,000 people were deported. April 1940, 320,000. June and July of 1940, 240,000. And June of 1941, 200 to 300,000 deported. So the trains took a two week trip, dislodged their cargo, took another two weeks. That takes you from February to April. April to June. This is a letter from my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, to Vladju, who I assume was in prison near Arkhangelsk at the time. They had been resettled. There is no work. We have all our clothes. They took the furniture and the cow. We live in a hut with Vodatinska paying 25 rubles. This is Vodatinska, was a friend of the family that I knew when I was a little kid. She settled in Chicago as well. Danota is starting to talk. Danota is my mother's sister, Dana, and Halina is speaking Russian. So most deportees were settled in Poshoeks, which were the special settlements, where we were put to work felling trees for building. This is a photo of my father's family. And this is my father, my grandfather, my aunt, my grandmother. I assume this is Olenka, my other aunt. We don't have the full fragment of that photo. And these are the Panics in Russia. So my grandfather, Walter Panic, and my uncle, Casimir, or Casey Panic. So Walter Panic, he was a farmer in Poland. But he worked in Russia as a teamster hauling timber. And my father told a story where he would smuggle grain home at night in his boots to help feed the family because he was tending the horses or the mules or whatever they used at that time. Conditions were harsh. So this is the winter of 1940. That winter, we were the only family who didn't have anyone die 
Mary asked, well, where were they? How did they die? Were they being shot? And my dad said, matter of factly, most died from starvation. We lived in a long residence hall with a central stove, and each family had a room. So again, these are eyewitness sketches, and this would be the room your family would have. And here's your stove. There were bed bugs and lice. According to Sword, Polish prisoners of war captured by the Soviets numbered 190,000. So most of the POW officers were executed by the NKVD in 1940 in April of 1940. 4,000 from the Kozielsk camp were found in one mass grave in Katyn Forest near Smolensk in 1943 by the ad advancing Nazi forces. Only 450 prisoners survived imprisonment in this camp out of 190,000. This is a map showing how prisoners were transferred from the prisoner of war camps to the areas where they were executed and buried in mass graves. Uh, this indicates uh, prisoners that were taken from civil jails or Polish jails that were, that were run by the Soviets and taken to other areas of extermination. Yes? Um, isn't that mass grave in Katia and Forest? Has that been Yes, so the Katyn. Uh, massacre was a point of controversy. Um, when the graves were uncovered by the German forces when they attacked against Russia in 1943, uh, the German, the Nazis were using that as propaganda against the communists. And the communists went back and denied it. They said, no, you guys are the murderers, you killed them. So the cotton controversy or the true culprits uh, they were, the Russians denied being involved for decades afterwards. So yeah, there's a lot of information about Katyn. There's, I think, a movie and a book titled Katyn um, that tells some of the story, and I'll, I'll give you some of the details. <clears throat> this is from an article written by a CIA researcher uh, regarding Stalin's killing field. On 5th of March, 1940, Stalin signed their death warrant, an AKVD, NKVD order condemning 21,857 prisoners to the supreme penalty, shooting. Those were Stalin's words, in quotes. They had been condemned as, quote unquote, hardened and uncompromising enemies of Soviet authority. Those who died at Katyn alone included an admiral, two generals, 24 colonels, 79 lieutenant colonels, 258 majors, 654 captains, 17 naval captains, 3,420 non-commissioned officers, seven chaplains, three landowners, a prince, 43 officials, 85 privates, and 131 refugees. Also among the dead were 20 university professors, 300 physicians, several hundred lawyers, engineers, and teachers, and more than 100 writers and journalists as well as about 200 pilots. It was their social status that landed them in front of the execution squads. Most of the victims were reservists who had been mobilized when Germany invaded. In all, the NKVD eliminated almost half the Polish officer corps, part of Stalin's long-range effort to prevent the resurgence of an independent Poland. So when you see mass graves, the thought is they were lined up next to the hole and shot, but actually uh, they were taken in waves and executed uh, in the prison. So these are photos taken from the exhumation uh, in 1943 uh, by, the, uh, by the Nazis. Uh, there was one grave that was uh, five layers deep, 500 people in each layer. Mm -hmm. June 22nd, 1941, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa. This followed the conquest of France. Do you recall that uh, Hitler invaded uh, the Netherlands uh, May 10th, 1940, and then pr proceeded through Luxembourg, Belgium, and fought in France and overtook France. Uh, the Polish army that was able to ex escape the Russian invasion uh, actually mobilized and escaped via Romania as well as Sweden and fought 
along with the French forces against the Nazis. Hitler, because he had conquered France, needed access to more material, war material, specifically petroleum, and was interested in access to the oil fields in the Middle East and the Balkans. So he launched a, uh, an attack against Russia along an 1,800 mile front, utilizing four million troops to try to gain access to oil wealth. When Hitler turned against uh, Stalin, the Polish government in exile shot, sought an opening with the Russians uh, and formed a pact. Uh, General Sikorsky met with uh, Ambassador Maisky from Russia in response to Hitler's attack. Stalin consented to formation of a Polish army and diplomatic relations to be established with the Polish government in exile. So a couple of things. The Russians were being attacked. And they were going to be needing a lot of reinforcements. Russians knew they had able-bodied men living on Soviet soil that had been deported. Let's form an army. So there were actually a couple of armies that were formed. One was a Berling army that comprised, was comprised mostly of communist sympathizers that fought right alongside with the Red Army. Uh, Sikorsky didn't want much of a part of that. He was more interested in uh, being uh, allied with the Allies under British control, and he proposed the formation of Polish Second Corps to fight with the British, and instead of fighting on the Eastern Front between Russia and Germany, try to defend the Middle East. So Stalin agreed to grant and this is Stalin's words in quote, amnesty to all Polish citizens on Soviet territory at present deprived of their freedom as prisoners of war or on other adequate grounds, being Polish. So just to highlight some of the, the key points about Polish military involvement, uh, the Polish government in exile fled to London and Polish forces fought with the British. Uh, the Polish aviators were the second uh, largest contingent behind the British of actual pilots that fought in the Battle of Britain. There were Polish and Czechoslovakian flyers that were involved in the Battle of Britain. And the Polish First Corps on the Western Front uh, fought uh, in France. And here's a picture of the, the Poles with uh, Churchill. So the sikorsky maisky Pact of July 30th, 1941 granted amnesty, and as a result, freed my families from deportation or confinement. So this pact was also a response to the need for army reinforcements, as, as we mentioned. Another reason to release the Poles was the Soviets were responsible for feeding and housing the Poles, even though they were getting meager rations. At that time, the average Soviet citizen was starving as well. Before the Maisky Pact, there were International Red Cross and Polish Relief Services that were sending aid to these settlements where Poles were housed, and it was an embarrassment to the Soviet government. So the Soviets said, enough, let's free ourselves of these people, let's get them out of here. So Sikorsky met with Stalin, and they uh, pulled General Władysław Anders out of a Soviet prison, gave him a shirt and pants, but not a pair of shoes, threw him in a car, <laughs> told him, gave him a cup of tea and a cigarette, and said, you're going to put together an army on Russian soil to fight against the Nazis. And we all recall September, or December 7th, 1941 is when the United States officially entered the Second World War. So with the amnesty, Poles were released from their settlements or imprisonment or their special accommodations. And there was a mustering of a Polish Second Corps. So all able-bodied men joined the, uh, the cause. This is uh, a record of my mother's father's uh, enlistment uh, into the Polish Second Corps, and he's uh, being based with the 5th Military Hospital. So the Corps mustered in basically Kazakhstan, 
and this is a map taken from Sword, Sword's book, the Polish government in exile gave orders to Anders with the approval of the Soviets, because they had formal diplomatic relations at the time, for the transfer of 30,000 troops and 10,000 accompanying civilians to British territories in Persia. So they were to be mobilized and the Second Corps, Polish Second Corps, was to fight under the command of the British forces. So in this map, we can see how there were mustering sites throughout the southern Soviet republics and the first evacuation of civilians along with Polish military, either by land through the mountains to Iran or across the Caspian Sea to uh, Pelevi, Iran, at that time known as Persia. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an interesting photo I got from Google Images, and it came with a translation. So when Poles were being uh, amnestied, uh, you know, when they were in these settlements, the children they actually received schooling and indoctrination on Soviet philosophies. Uh, so this is a poster where uh, the children are standing under the poster. It says, thank you, Comrade Stalin, for our happy childhood. So my father tells a story once when he was small that uh, they would get ridiculed when they would pray. They were, Poles were Catholic and, you know, they'd get together and have their services or, or they'd, you know, uh, pray before a, a cross or crucifix if they had one uh, or have communal prayers and the Russian prison guards would say, you should uh, worship him. They're pointing to the picture of Stalin on the wall said, do that, we'll give you candy. So the Panic family was released from the work camp in June of 1941. And my father's father had suffered a broken leg in Russia as he was in the woods felling trees and, and driving teams of horses and didn't set well, so he was not eligible to serve in the army. <clears throat> they headed east with the family deeper into Siberia as Russian forces mobilized to the Western Front. My father tells stories of foraging for food. They were picking what he called labioda, and I looked that up, it's actually pigweed, and it grows on the side of the road. He tells stories of trapping turtles in ponds or trapping songbirds to eat, because they were basically scrounging for food. They were released from the Pashoek, and they had to find their way where, where are they gonna go? There was, they wanted to get together with the mustering Polish Second Corps because they assumed there would be civilian support for civilians who were accompanying the soldiers. And my uncle, Casey, actually uh, enlisted in the Second Corps too. But my father's family traveled as far as Novosibirsk in Siberia before linking up with Poles following the army mobilization and continued on through the so Southern so uh, Socialist Republics. So Poland is over here. Here's Moscow. Here's the Ural Mountains. They got all the way over here, more than halfway to China before they hooked up with the Second Corps mustering to make their way out of Russia. So there's a deportation where the Russians took them against their own will to Russia and the exile, like the Israelites coming out of Egypt. Yes? Did they walk? Did they have a cart? How did they get there? So, Hopping trains, trying to get, uh, you know, get on a farmer's cart if they knew it was hitchhiking, walking, whatever. Whatever that they could do with what they had. This is a uh, Google photo, uh, shows troops uh, mustering in the winter of 1941, Polish troops. They eventually uh, organized in Tashkent, in Kazakhstan, Ashabad, in uh, Baghdad, Iraq as well. So after my grandfather was uh, released, he mustered in Jalalabad, July 20th, 1942. And since he had escaped in 39, the first time he saw his family was in 1942. This is a picture of them in Kyrgyzstan. So he's a little thinner than in the previous pictures he saw of him. And this is my mother and my aunt. Yes. How did they possibly meet up? <laughs> well, it was the Polish government in exile it had some semblance of systems to track people. So when the Sikorsky-Maisky Pact came to existence and there was formal diplomatic relations, uh, 
Uh, the polls were charged with setting up local organizations uh, or representatives to help guide the relief of polls, number one, before they were exiled, and then to kind of organize them into, into units. So it was basically kind of like a support system for the polls. So word spread fast, you know, either through the radio or whatever print they had or just word of mouth. Um, Hope that answers your question. That's, a, that's the best answer I could give you. So what happened, too, is eventually Polish and Soviet relations kind of broke down a little bit. And these special uh, representatives that had been set up were then, over time, being suspected by the Soviets of being, quote unquote, spies. So after a while, they just shut down the whole operation. They actually, once the Polish Second Corps uh, left uh, Russian Soviet soil, they basically shut down the embassy in, in, in Moscow, the Polish embassy. The Caspian Sea crossing. Was uh, remarkable. I, I don't have exact dates of when my, my father noted he passed, but he said there were thousands of people on a ship that had Four bathrooms. People were sick. They were suffering of dysentery, typhoid. I don't know how long it took to cross the Caspian Sea, but if someone died or perished, they were thrown overboard because they knew there wouldn't be any accommodations for a proper funeral when they got on land. They had been burying their, their friends and family in Russia as they were, when they were uh, deported. So there was a Caspian Sea crossing from the port of Krasnodvotsk in Kazakhstan to Pahlavi in Persia. And in the Pahlavi uh, transit camp, 38,000 Poles passed through Pahlavi. 5% of the evacuees died in these transit camps. They were sick. They were starving. Uh, they had relief because at that time, Persia was occupied jointly by the Russians and the British forces. So they had access to delousing. Uh, old ragged clothes were burned. Um, the refugees, the, the soldiers that were mobilized, as well as any families that managed to get along with them, uh, had access to medical care and food. And my father tells stories about how some people had a real good, nutritious meal for the first time in a couple of years. He said some people ate themselves sick to the point where some of them died. I want to show this little video. This is a newsreel that kind of tells the story of the passage out of Russia into Persia. Out of the land of Poland, there came a band of refugees. A nomadic company had now arrived at the Transcaucasian foothills after an exodus that started four years ago. The fragment of a migration which has wended its laborious way through Russia to Persia. You see here a typical family caught up in the pathetic tide. Their name is Kowalski, a family of six. Father, mother, grown-up son and daughter, and two small children. They have managed to escape the separation which has broken so many thousands of other families. The Kowalskis are symbolic of the spirit which no dictator can prize loose from a nation. For four years, these emigrants from tyranny have stuck together. During their wanderings, mothers have given birth to children on a bed of salvage. Those precious bundles they cling to, containing objects of a family's worship, and held on to because they're made beautiful by memory. Journey's end, the promised land, the reward of infinite suffering as the band of pilgrims arrives at its destination to be overwhelmed by their country folk already living on Persian soil. To intrude upon this scene of paradise is to witness the frantic search for relatives, the strength of feeling which, as loved ones are found, sweeps this refugee camp like a forest fire and consumes everything in a blaze of unfettered emotion. <laughs> to this temporary home near the Caspian Sea came Pate cameraman Terry Ashwood. From the frontier to this home for the homeless, he had followed their journey. Now, within the enclosure, he sees establishment officers registering the newcomers. The victims of Poland's agony find a haven of rest in Persia. <laughs> 
British and American Red Cross associations supply them with new clothing. Small wonder if these suffering people had given up hope of ever finding happiness again. So I'll, I'll end it there, um, only because we've got some more territory to cover. But the point I want to make is I got this video from my father, and he told me that oh, we didn't look like that. He said we were in tattered rags. So these were people that had been fed for a few weeks that you're seeing in the video. So the Panics arrived in Pahlavi, August 2nd, 1942. They spent time in Isfahan. <coughs> They left for India from Akhvaz, and I'll tell the story of how they wound up in India. So Machinskis were in Persia while Walter was serving in a military hospital in Palestine. There was a union, reunion in Tehran um, where Casey, who you can see in the military uniform, had been mobilized with the Polish Second Corps, and he was able to rejoin his family after being on, in training. And you can see my father, here, my two aunts, and my aunt Alexandra is in a scout uniform. This was taken on the street in Tehran, and there happened to be a stray dog walking by, a white dog. And my dad begged to have the dog in the picture because it reminded him of his dog, Pikush. So we talked about the Aghaz uh, transit camp accommodating 3,000 from 42 to 43. And a total of 22,000 Poles were shipped out of Akhfaz to the Persian Gulf for sea transport to Africa, Mexico, or India. Uh, the, the British government had made arrangements for transfer of Poles and petitioned other allied countries to accept these refugees. So there are people in, in South Africa, there are people in actually Australia, New Zealand, South America, Mexico, uh, and India uh, that were that wound up settling in those countries after the war. Leaders of the British Women's Voluntary Service proposed the idea of placing Poles in India in 42, after hearing reports about the suffering of Poles in Russia from the military. The heads of the British Relief Service and officials at the British Treasury made plans for resettlement of Poles in India. General Sikorsky personally appealed to Winston Churchill for assistance in the evacuation of 50,000 children from Russia who would otherwise starve. The government of India, urged, the British, urged by the British government, agreed to receive the Poles, but only provide minimal resources. India would provide no electricity and reserve the right to control the finances, distribution, and maintenance, and giving advice to delegates of the Polish authorities. This is the Maharaja Jam Sahib. His name was Dig Vijayasinji Rathsinjinji. He was a Maharaja and ruler of the Indian princely state of Nawanagar at the time. He accepted the first contingent of refugees housing 500 orphans after building a camp on his property and placing a school in his guest house. After Maharaja's offer, arrangements to accommodate the children in India moved along very quickly. The first step in transferring Poles to India was a joint effort funded by charitable donations that the Maharaja was able to uh, gather. The Polish government in exile guaranteed to cover the difference between the charitable contributions and the actual expenses backed by the Polish gold reserves that were now safely in London. This is a photo of uh, my grandmother and my mom and my aunt at the time they were settling in India. There was some trouble getting the Poles out of Persia to India because there were German and Japanese U-boats in the Indian Ocean in the Straits of Hormuz. There was also threats to the state of India because the Japanese had been occupying Burma. In one two-month period, 40 ships were sunk by the Germans and four by the Japanese. And my dad recollects that they were stuck in the Persian Gulf, the Straits of Hormuz, because of Japanese U-boat activities. These are pictures of my grandfather, my mother's father, and my uncle, uh, Casey Panic. Walter applied to join the Second Corps Walter Panic, my father's father, but he was rejected due to poor healing of the leg fracture I mentioned earlier. Casey Panic left the family to join at 17 years of age. He was mobilized in Russia and trained as a paratrooper, making 47 jumps. Family tradition is that he was in training to be dropped behind enemy lines in civilian clothes with gold bars sewn in his belt. He was never involved in combat. 
My mother's father, Władysław Fosmaczynski, served as a quartermaster for the 6th Polish Field Hospital, and his service included time in Palestine, North Africa, and Italy under British command, in the command of General Anders. Here's a picture of my, my grandfather in his service uniform and some of the documentation documenting the, the passage of the Polish Second Corps through Palestine, North Africa, and up the boot into Italy, which culminated in the Battle of Monte Cassino on May 18th, 1944, uh, which was a turning point uh, in the, turning the battle in liberating Italy uh, from the Axis forces. And these are some mementos of my grandfather's service. Uh, he was awarded a recognition by the Polish Carpathian divisions, which were instrumental in, in uh, capturing Monte Cassino. In fact, there are over a thousand Polish war dead in Monte Cassino at a Polish military cemetery. And then about this time was D-Day, May 18th, 1944. So some of my ancestors were outside of Poland, but I have an uncle who married my, my father's sister, Sophie, Wallace Schabel, was in Warsaw during the entire period. Here I am with him at his 90th birthday party. And uh, the symbol below him is the insignia for the uh, Armia Kraina, the AK, which, which was the Polish underground that fought against both uh, the Nazis as well as the Russians to a certain extent. But Wallace was involved with smuggling goods to aid the underground army. And he experienced both German and Russian occupation. He actually tells a story where he was imprisoned in a university building in Warsaw with other people that were resistance fighters. And uh, occasionally they would have lineups because if a Nazi uh, soldier was killed by an underground sniper, they'd line everybody up and count out 10 people and go shoot them. And uh, Uncle Wally tells a story of standing next to a guy and the guy next to him was like shaking and, and you know, what do I do, what do I do? He says, don't let him see you, be afraid because then they'll pull you out. He said, just pray. Just pray and look straight ahead. And he got pulled out once, but nothing happened to him. Um, the, the talk was that if they had you empty your pockets after they pulled you out, you knew you were gonna be shot because they didn't want any, any identification on the bodies. Mm -hmm. He did tell a story of once they were lining people up and you know, one of the people that was jailed with him was trying to hide under a piano. This was in a university building, under a grand piano. He said the German officer pulled him out and shot him right there. So interesting, he was, somehow he got out of prison and then he was uh, deported to Germany where he worked on a work farm. And uh, he was uh, working for a uh, German baron who was sympathetic to Poles because he was Roman Catholic. And he said Germany was a beautiful country. He was treated well once he was on German soil, but they needed his work to feed the German war machine. He also tells a story of uh, how he once slept with a nun. Uh, they were escaping or in exile or in, or in transit and uh, there was a nun, a, a novice, someone who was uh, entering uh, uh, to be a sister. Um, and she was a young woman and the Russians were coming and he knew the Russians would rape the young women. He says, Russians would rape women, Germans wouldn't. Um, so they had an old rug, they rolled her up in a rug, and they, they slept with their heads on that rug. He says, did I ever tell you I slept with a nun? <laughs> <laughs> so he just tells stories out of the blue. He's a great guy. Always positive. He told another story. He was on grave detail. They had to dig graves when they were in, in, um, in uh, the German prison. So they would find a plot of land anywhere in the city and start digging a grave to bury a body. He said, some, for some reason, a sniper started shooting at him. He said, it was muddy, it was raining, and they're out in the open. They gotta, they gotta run for cover. So he said, they didn't have helmets on, so they put the shovels on their heads and they ran around the corner. And he said, when we got around the corner, we pulled the shovels off and the mud was running down our foreheads. We laughed. You know, he, and he, he tells, he laughs when he tells the story. Just amazing guy. So this is the Valavade camp where my parents settled. So Valavade was a camp established um, 
uh, by the Polish uh, government. Um, and it, it was in existence from 1943 to 1947. It was out, located outside the city of Kolapur, south of Bombay. The building was funded by the Polish government in exile from a loan from the British government, obviously backed by the Polish uh, bullion. Construction started in 43 and was completed in November, uh, starting in March, completed in November, and they housed 5,000 people. The site was selected based on the availability of fresh water and a temperate climate. So this is uh, from the Orange Book, Poles in India. My father has made notes where he indicated where they lived, their barracks, uh, where his father worked in a store, where there was a farm. And he tells some nice stories. He has fond memories of this experience because if they were starving, suffering through the winters of Siberia, now they're in India where it's sunshine, they have fresh fruit. Um, they only have to contend with malaria, so. <laughs> In the camp, there were five zones of 28 barracks, each containing 10 family units of two rooms and a kitchen. There were dirt floors in the living area and sand cement screed in the kitchen, and they cooked over charcoal. Single persons had individual rooms with a communal kitchen. The dirt floor was sealed with dung to control dust and insects. And they had a full social service network consisting of a hospital, post office, uh, shops, you know, cobblers, places where you could have uh, garments made or mended. There's also an orphanage for 500 children. This is a letter from my mother to her father. So my, uh, my grandfather never saw his family in India. Dear Daddy, thank you very much for the package of sweets in your letter. And this was written to him as he was mobilizing, uh, heading out after the end of hostilities towards London. Daddy, I feel very good. Mommy buys us fruit every day. Dearest father, I have a big request. It would be to buy and send another scarf. It is not for me, but for another girl I ride to, with to Kolapur. Her name is Yadviga Malevska. I ride with her to visit friends who are Indian. We are having good time visiting. She is a friend. She has a friend in London. Maybe you can visit. Have a safe trip. Love your daughter, Helena. And this is a photo from that same book um, showing this is my mother in one of the classrooms. And this is my father from family photos on a scout outing. On the camp, there were nine school buildings with six classrooms each. Walls were bamboo matting and the floors were dirt. Sliding windows had stretched cotton sheets instead of bamboo matting. Yes. Your mother and father were in the same camp. Yes. Okay. That's how they. Yeah. Met. So no. No. Okay. So they met in Chicago in the fifties. Oh. <laughs> okay. But, okay. but they were there at the same time. They were there at the same time, and my mother knew of my father because when he was a kid, he was a troublemaker. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a panic family in Valavadi, and my my father. Well, troublemaker, that's the term my mother used. So. <laughs> and this is a, a photo of my aunt, Alexandra Olenka. Uh, she was stricken with malaria when she was in India. Unfortunately, she recovered. The end of World War II with the uh, atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Led to the end of hostilities along with the end of hostilities in, in Europe. Władysław Smaczynski was discharged in 1946. And this is a, a copy of his military documents with the discharge stamped and then enlistment in PRC in 1946. Are the yes. blacked out sections redacted? Is that why we're... I have no idea why that's blacked out. Maybe something was entered in error. So I'll tell you about the Polish Resettlement Corps the PRC. The meeting in Yalta between Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill sealed the fate of Poles. Britain formally withdrew, withdrew the recognition of the legality of the Polish government in exile on the 6th of July of 1945. The charade of free elections in Poland, proposed by Stalin, was to follow with the imposition of communist government and the onset of the Cold War. 
The final insult was with recognition of the new regime's sovereignty by the Allies. This left the Poles in exile in effect a mercenary force under the command of the British. After hostilities, Walter Smuczynski was transferred with the Polish Second Corps to England and enlisted in the Polish Resettlement Corps. At the end of the war, many Poles who fought under the British wished to stay in the United Kingdom. The PRC was formed in 1946 and was disbanded after fulfilling its purpose in 49. And it was established through the Polish Resettlement Act of 1947, which was the first mass immigration legislation passed by Parliament in the United Kingdom. It offered British citizenship to over 200,000 displaced Polish troops on British soil. A good deal of the work linked to this act involved the creation of the Polish Resettlement Corps. Former Army and Air Force camps were utilized as temporary accommodation for the Polish troops and ultimately their families. By October 1946, some 120,000 Polish troops had been quartered in 265 military camps throughout the United Kingdom. Over the years, wives and dependents were also brought to Britain to join them, as my mother's family joined my, my grandfather, bringing the estimated total to over 249,000. They lived in Nisset or Quonset huts initially. The Panic family arrived from India to England aboard the SS Ormond in 1947. This is a, a family photo. And the Smachinskis followed on the Empire Brent. And this is a photo of uh, my mother, my mother and sister, my grandfather, my grandmother, and my grandmother's brother in England. So my mother and her sister uh, attended boarding school. Uh, Holy Family of Nazareth, Nazareth Boarding School. This was to be an advantage with them in time with immigrating to the United States. They became fluent in the English language. The Panic family immigrated to the U.S. in 1949. Walter, my grandfather, Maria, his wife, Sophie and Mitchell immigrated in 1949 based on Maria's U.S. citizenship. Remember, she was born in Buffalo, New York. Olenka and Casey, because they were over 18 years old and Polish citizens had to wait on quota to immigrate into the United States. Casey was discharged from the Polish Second Corps in 1949 and lived in England with Olenka until they immigrated. Who was that individual that was at the far right? So on the far right is Casey. A resemblance for you, to you. Yeah, to maybe. With him. His girlfriend, and this is, I think, Zoshka Olenka, and then my father. This is a manifest of inbound passengers from the SS Aquitania, which shipped from Southampton, England, to Halifax, Nova Scotia. Mary was able to find this online through Ancestry, is that right? Uh, so a lot of these old records are available on the internet. And it shows the names of uh, Walter, Marie, Sophie, and, and Mitchell. And this shows um, their point of entry They uh, actually debarked in Halifax, took a train uh, through Canada, entered the United States in Port Huron. And um, they took the train from Port Huron to Dearborn Station in Chicago. And my father remembers uh, being picked up by a friend of the family uh, on a Friday. Uh, and by Monday, his father and his mother already had jobs lined up. So there was, all, there was a good support network uh, to help the immigrants. So why Poles could not return to their homeland? Soviet officials took property and accommodations for the new administration of, of the government. So a lot of these deportees had nothing to come back to. In fact, it was dangerous. There were, pass there were pacification operations, burning of villages and summary executions of suspected AK, Armia Kraina, the home army or underground army uh, operatives carried out by the NKVD. And the Soviets continued to deport people from 44 to 48. I just want to give you some background in US immigration policy. So going back to the 1800s, uh, Americans encouraged relatively free and open immigration during the 18th and 19th centuries and rarely questioned that policy until the late 1800s. 
After certain states passed immigration laws following the Civil War, the Supreme Court in 1875 declared declaration, I'm sorry, declared regulation of immigration a federal responsibility. Thus, as the number of immigrants rose in the 1880s and economic conditions in some areas worsened, Congress began to pass immigration legislation. The Immigration Act of 1924 limited the no number of immigrants allowed entry into the United States through a national origins quota. The quota provided immigration visas equal to 2% of the total number of people of each nationality in the United States as of the 1890 census. Okay. So if you were an ethnic group that had so many thousands of people and you, know, you consisted of 2% you know, of the population, they would determine that number and that's how many would be let in every year. Immediately after World War II, the United States was pressured to deal with over 30 million dislocated Europeans, including a million displaced persons, or DPs, who had been forced from their homelands during the war. President Harry S. Truman issued a directive in 1946 to allocate half of the European quotas for refugee admissions. Enacted in 1948 and amended in 1950, the Displaced Persons Act authorized the admission of 202,000 individuals in two years. These measures were developed within the framework of the existing immigration law allowed by allowing nations to mortgage their future quotas. The DP Acts eventually admitted 400,000 Europeans. From 1949 to 1952, almost half of the new immigrants were admitted as refugees. Most of them had no connections with American citizens. Because many of the newcomers had no connections to the United States, or in the United States, assistance was provided through voluntary service networks, VOLAGs. As this practice continued, the VOLAGs, voluntary assistance organizations, and religious, and the religious and ethnic groups involved in them also began to influence American immigration policy. So international politics during the Cold War led to more lenient immigration policies over time. The 1953 Refugee Act abandoned the mortgaging practices of the DPX, admitting 214,000 refugees as non-quota immigrants. So my father, I'm sorry, my father's family uh, had some assistance from an organization called, by the name of the Polish American Congress, which was one of those VOLAGs, or volunteer, voluntary assistance groups. So as you recall, my grandmother, Maria Panic was a U.S. citizen by birth, allowing her to bring her family into the country with her, arri arriving uh, through Port Huron, Sarnia, and uh, settling in Chicago. Uh, Maria's brother, Walter Ledvoin, lived in Chicago and sponsored them. At the time, the Polish-American Congress was active in helping settle Polish refugees in the U.S. They are a VOLAG and provided services from food, in housing to vocational and language training to new arrivals. My father tells a story of one of the local uh, Polish American Congress executives actually putting people up and feeding them in his own home in Chicago. <clears throat> so the, my father's family did well. This is a picture of my grandmother. Within a few years, they, were, they made enough money to purchase some property, which included apartment, apartments above a grocery store. So they ran a grocery for a while. My mother's family uh, immigrated to New York in 1951 and settled in Chicago. So Ginevefa worked as a dressmaker and Vladislav worked as a technician for AAA tool saw service and supply company. Fortunately, my mother's father died in 1956. And this is a picture of an engagement photo of my parents and this is a picture of me with my grandma panic. <laughs> so that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> but I do want to remind you that refugees will always be with us. Today there are 20 million refugees around the world. The average length of stay in a refugee camp is 17 years for these people. So. This has been going on for ages and probably will go on for ages, but we have to be sensitive to what people go through. So I, I thank you for your attention. Are there any questions?
Is your mother still alive? Yes. In Chicago? Yeah, they live in uh, Sarasota, Florida. Oh, okay. My mother and my father. Yes? Did you grow up learning speaking Polish? That's a good question. So just to backtrack a little bit, I mean, um, so I had a lot of cousins, aunts and uncles in Chicago, and like many new immigrants, you know, we would socialize and get together on weekends and holidays. Uh, and uh, some of us spoke Polish in the home, some didn't. My father was a mechanical engineer. He went to night school for 11 years to get his bachelor's. My mother was a registered nurse. So they were professionals, and they spoke Polish uh, with their siblings, but with us, they brought us up speaking English. On the other hand, I do have some cousins who spoke Polish in the home, and when we'd go visit, and we would be playing with our cousins, and my uncle would hear us speaking English. He'd shake his finger at us, say, po polsku, you know, speak Pol say it in Polish. Um, in fact, there are Polish schools in Chicago where children can be sent on Saturdays to uh, maintain the Polish language, Polish culture, and I, and I have some cousins who actually went to Polish school through high school. So they were able to read Polish literature, some of the classics, and to this day, they have a better command of the language. So I spoke Polish to my grandmother because she would watch me when my mom was working and my dad was working. But you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. So I have a very limited vocabulary. I've got the vocabulary of a seven-year-old. So I can't do professional Polish speaking. You know, yes? With all the cousins here, are there any, is there anybody in Poland that so my, my aunt, Donna, lives in Poland. I have, her son lives in Chicago. My father has cousins that live in Poland. I think my mother lost track of her relatives. And it's kind of sketchy, you know, you're trying to <coughs> ask about recollections and things they haven't thought about since the 50s or 60s, as far as locations where people lived. Mm -hmm. Yes? Rich, you know that uh, the 79 tons of gold that was taken out into Canada, so how did that, uh, was it, was the currency still, the Polish currency at that time, was that, so that was solid because it was backed up by the gold, or how did it all, <clears throat> you know, the... So gold is, gold is gold, yeah. and, and you can assign a dollar value to it or a złota value to it, but at the time, they had the gold, and they used it as collateral for loans to pay the relief workers in India in British pounds, or you know, pay the soldiers in France in French francs. Uh, so that's how that that happened. And the gold was eventually repatriated back to Poland after the war. Have your parents been back to Poland? Yes, several times. And you? Yes. Yeah. And they, my parents have been back to India. They actually mm -hmm. visited the the site of the former camp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have they been back to the area where they had to? So that's an interesting question. I think uh, it was approximately 50 years after my father was deported to Russia, or maybe 50 years after he was amnestied. Uh, he was a mechanical engineer, and he was doing independent contracting for a pharmaceutical company. And they were going to be building uh, pharmaceutical plants in Russia. So he was able to retrace his journey because he flew to Moscow and they were building things kind of near the Ural Mountains. He said, yeah, I took the same trip, you know, over Poland, through Russia, almost to <coughs> Siberia, you know, on, a, on an airliner part of the way and then part of the way on a private jet, as opposed to a boxcar. Yeah. So that was interesting. After communism fell, was any property restored back to your family then in Poland? <laughs> you had any claim to it? So there is some property that uh, apparently title was kept in the name of my father's father and subsequently his wife, and then it was passed down to the oldest um, you know, siblings. So my father and his sister apparently have some right of property in Poland, a small wooded area in the countryside. Um, but I don't know, it's kind of murky. I mean, who's been paying property taxes if they had taxes, you know? Uh, he has visited that site, and he said it's basically just a vacant area where people sometimes go to harvest timber and 
And he kind of brings it up every time we have family reunions saying, you know, we got to talk about the property in Poland because I have a cousin who's a, a realtor, uh, but he doesn't speak, but he doesn't speak Polish. So what's, what's that going to get us? Um, yeah, I, I can't answer that question as far as, you know, what was able to be repatriated. Yes. You mentioned the court system. When he came to Canada, did Canada have a quarter at that time? Well, he was in transit through Canada. Okay, it was just transit. So before they left England, they registered with the American consulate to immigrate to America. They subsequently got their green cards and underwent naturalization. So I actually have my father's green card, my grandfather's green card, their certificates of naturalization. Yeah. Okay, it's 11.30. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.